This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. If you're taking care of a senior loved one, then you know it can be hard. Remember, it's okay to ask for help. There's a reason why 29 million families have turned to care.com. Experienced senior caregivers can help with everything from meal prep to taking your loved one to doctor's appointments. And every caregiver you hire is background checked. So important for peace of mind. Find full-time, part-time, or even occasional help that fits your family's schedule and budget. Get the support you need with Care.com. My dad works in B2B marketing. He came by my school for career day and said he was a big ROAS man. Then he told everyone how much he loved calculating his return on ad spend. My friends still laugh at me to this day. Not everyone gets B2B, but with LinkedIn, you'll be able to reach people who do. Get a $100 credit on your next ad campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash results to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash results. Terms and conditions apply. LinkedIn, the place to be, to be. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You might think food waste is a problem that is well on its way to being solved. Why cover it again on the food programme, you might ask, as we have many times over the years. Well, here's why. In the UK, over 10 million tonnes of food a year goes to waste. Food that could have been sold and eaten despite years of food waste campaigning. So there is the vast scale of the problem that just isn't going away. Bananas from the Caribbean, blueberries from South Africa, if that was winter. Foods from all all across the planet. It's just crazy. I mean, a lot of foods also didn't even make it out of their packaging. Crucially, there is also a new government who have said that a zero-waste economy is one of their top priorities for the environment. Introducing mandatory food waste reporting, it's a fairly easy win for Labour to come in and say, yeah, we're going to do this, because they've been criticising the last government for not doing it. What will this mean for food waste? And is it individuals or businesses who can really make a difference? And so in this programme, we are going after some new answers. I'm Leila Kazim, this is The Food Programme, and this week we are going deep into bins, dumpsters, fridges and shelves for an update on waste and what to do about it. Some of my, you know, particular, you know, gold mines were 180 bags of coffee, you know, 2,000 eggs. I only could, I could only bring back 800. Those cut meats that people use for sandwiches. I mean, I found, you know, 50 boxes that hadn't even made it out. It's larger, a wholesale box. Now that isn't the world's largest shopping list as much as it might sound like it is. It is, in fact, the average nightly haul of former professional dumpster diver Matt Homewood. But, I mean, it goes far beyond food. I mean, I found slippers, dressing gowns, new crockery from China, a lot of fresh produce from Spain and Italy, of course. But what is dumpster diving, you may well be asking? And why are we starting this week's programme with Matt? From what I understand, in Britain, it used to be called skipping. Uh, And it used to be quite widespread in British culture up until apparently kind of when New Labour came into government in 97. And then basically sometime in the early noughties, apparently a lot of businesses became nervous, perhaps, with the scale of the food waste they were generating. And so today, when you go up to the back end of a British supermarket, you'll see massive fences with CCTV cameras uh, all around their trash, their recycling. So it's kind of a a strange situation in Britain. There are a few dumpster divers or skippers who are still active in Britain, but they're few and far between, it has to be said. But here in Denmark, dumpster diving is legal. And so with that comes an enormous dumpster diving population. So I've met, for example, pensioners. There's so much food, once you know about it, well, why go spend, you know... 50 quid at the shop when you can just, you know, stock up on organic fruit and vegetables round the back. Why indeed. Matt clocked something about how to wake people up to the scale of our waste problem. Rather than just a number or words on a page, his pictures are powerful. Vast rows of cucumbers, dumpsters full of yoghurt or meat, 
massive jigsaws of blueberry packs, bananas, bread, you name it. When you see it all laid out like that, it's impossible to ignore. But awareness is only one factor. And so on this programme, we also hear from people who are finding fresh solutions. There's Emma Atkins, a self-confessed fridge enthusiast, doing a whole PhD on our relationship with the fridge. And as you can see, you can sort of swing the shelves around and it makes everything more visible. So they knew back then that visibility was a problem in the fridge and this design tried to mitigate against it. And actually the fridge has always been a box. It's never not been a box. And I think the visibility issues are to do with that box shape. Then there's the passionate food waste social media personalities like Ellie Pear and Max LaManna resuscitating your leftover veg. Before you arrived, I realised that this um, lettuce had been touching the back of the fridge, which is really naughty of me because I should have been more careful with it. But we can bring it back to life. So you have your defibrillator. Exactly. Yeah. It's the, going down. The, 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 the... Ice water step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll hear more from all of those characters later on. But alongside the work of various inspiring individuals, we are also asking what is happening on a bigger scale? What are the supermarkets and government doing about food waste? We'll find out. But first, back to Matt. And what made him turn from studious academic into political dumpster diver and part of a food waste underworld that exists in alleys and bins around the world? So my name is Matt Homewood. I'm a food waste campaigner uh, based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. I've been dumpster diving for about seven years. I set up the blog called An Urban Harvester, where I dumpster dived at my three local supermarkets here in, in Copenhagen, where I used to shop. But for a year, I decided I'm just going to go via the back and see what I can find. And so every day uh, after closing, I'd, I'd cycle up to the shops, see what I could find, bring back a portion of that food and then take photographs um, to really show people that a lot of the food waste that's described out there in the media isn't waste at all and is actually great food, which I lived off for a year. And those photographs really show just how pristine a lot of that food was. Yeah, the beautiful thing with those social media networks that I slowly developed was that I got connected to a lot of other people. And so, you know, you got a sense of all that food being chucked out right across the planet. So, for example, in the USA, you get more processed foods, for example. Uh, yeah, in Denmark, you get a lot of organic produce because Denmark, for example, um, per capita has the highest amount of uh, expenditure on organic produce. So it's, you've got peculiarities depending on the market, but, uh, but the food waste is persistent and systemic across markets, which goes to show that you know, this supermarket business model that's evolved since World War Two is, is, has a lot of common features. Matt's dramatic photos of his food waste swag quickly generated a large following on social media. But for him, it soon became about more than just a free meal. It quickly became a more political project than just um, living off the food. I mean, my partner and I lived off the food comfortably. But um, once you realise the scale of this problem, it becomes much more of a yeah, political activism project than just showing off the day's harvest. I mean, I wrote basically my master's thesis about how to transition the food system for the Anthropocene. So that was the idea, basically, to use this gold mine of, of Danish dumpster diving media that I'd, I'd kind of accumulated to then publish that on social media networks to essentially draw attention to this problem because we're a visual, very visual-based society. So once you've got people's attention, then I was just regurgitating all the research I'd done over three years for this master's. And so slowly but surely, you know, when people see 180 bags of coffee from a small store in Copenhagen, they're thinking, what the hell's going on? So then you can start really talking about the food system, the power symmetries, the power from the supermarkets, how farmers are basically bending over backwards and, you know, they're getting last minute cancellations, etc. Uh, so once you've got people thinking about the problem, then my hope, which was slightly naive, was that politicians might want to actually start doing something about it. 
We'll come back to Matt again a bit later on because it's time to meet someone else who spotted an issue with waste from supermarkets and other supply chains and came up with her own enterprising solution. Double door that says Wasted Kitchen. <laughs> Food with provenance and purpose. And this is where we're based. Yeah. So we're in Faversham in Kent at the Wasted Kitchen HQ, one of the finalists for this year's BBC Food and Farming Awards in the Takeaway Small Eatery and Street Food category. Katie Newton, the founder, is showing me around their small kitchen unit where they've just finished making 250 lunches for a school holiday club alongside prepping their weekly takeaway orders and deli salad lunches. The secret ingredient? Waste food. My passion is trying to get more people to eat real food and to use stuff that could be thrown away. It's like yesterday I got a phone call, do you want some beetroot? Well, oh. Yeah, and we trade that. So I'm interested to know how the surplus food comes to you. So should we do a walkthrough? Yeah. Like, yes. What happens? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, let's do that. This is like the brain salad mm. that's going out now. So we don't just take the surplus from them, we buy it. Right, because this in itself is very interesting. The surplus food, you're not just going around collecting it, you're actually no, purchasing we're, it. we're buying it, and that's really important to me. We're buying it or trading it one way or another. And why is that important to you? Because I want to show that this can be done commercially, and that for me is the whole reason for doing this, is making a change to the system, because you know there's lots of people doing good stuff with waste food but I haven't seen very many people doing mainstream stuff with waste food on a commercial basis and that is what I'm passionate about is showing that it can be shown that it can be done and I, you know my next step is helping other people do it right because unless we're, we're all responsible for it and uh, that's really important to me and it and I think by buying it it shows that this is food that has value it's not a waste I mean you've shown me a whole bucket of perfectly good looking ginger to me yeah. sometimes we get really small things yeah. people don't want really tiny things sometimes we get really massive things <laughs> and like they don't know what to do it's such yeah. a big melon that is why we've got ah, that okay so this is half a watermelon where it's got a sort of soft bruise on one bit but, <laughs> in the middle of it <laughs> but, but you're just going to cut around it that's just great isn't it probably put in a salad because that i guess that's what people might do at home but it doesn't really happen on a commercial it level. doesn't happen on a commercial basis and a lot of people don't do it at home and what i found is they just haven't got a lot of people haven't got the confidence to cook or use food in the way that perhaps people used to so that's the other part of what we do is share food skills and we run classes and run we're doing an eat the seasons challenge at the moment <laughs> i'm in an age where i can remember my meals being made by my grandparents from scratch but a lot of people don't have that mm. and um they haven't got those skills you know i've got an eight-year-old daughter i'm probably double the age of most of the mums in the playground but they most of them i'd say we really haven't got those skills uh, to actually cook from scratch or look at something or they haven't got the time you know mm. or they think they haven't got the time which mm. is probably the more to the point. Wow, is this a remoulade or a cook Yeah, store? this is a celery oh, remoulade. Yeah. It looks amazing. Um, there's a potato salad that had um, some quite sad herbs <laughs> hidden into it. Uh, so we're in Macmaid, which is kind of, wait, it's like a, it's a food hall, yeah. There's like a fresh fruit and veg and dried goods and dairy and that mention of Macmaid is the name of a shop, actually more like a food hall, where Wasted Kitchen is based. And this is key to their story as Katie's business exists almost as a bolt-on, buying less than perfect produce straight out of Macmaid's own warehouse. And it's this proximity that makes it feel like it could be a model other food businesses could replicate. It's a proper business you're running. Yeah. Is it profitable? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, does, it's not going to make me rich, but it makes me happy and it pays us all. And we have, you know, one of the discussions we have is, like, well, it should be cheaper, it's waste. Well, it shouldn't be cheaper. It's still got just the same value, if not more, because we've spent more time mm. doing stuff to it. And like, so, what's the, defin the definition of waste? I yeah. mean, a monkey cucumber is, is, yeah, is just not, a cucumber. Yeah. 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 So it's changing mindsets and particularly commercial mindsets. And I don't think we're privy to how much waste actually comes out well, at, at supermarket level. 
I mean, they used to throw it away and now they give it to food banks and what have you, which is a good thing to do with it. But it's no excuse not to do something commercially with it because someone's paying for that in the food cycle, right? The farmers are having to take the hit or someone is taking a hit on that produce that gets passed on for free, which is why it's so important for me that it all has a value. And yeah, there should be a wasted kitchen in every supermarket. <laughs> Okay, so um, here we've got ready-made lunches. Yeah, so these are what we call our kento bentos. Mm -hmm. So basically, <laughs> kento bentos. Brilliant. And and kento and bento, it's got what's it's in it? It's got some slaw, some potato salad. It's got celeriac. It's got uh, that's a red spicy ferment, and that's a grain salad in there. Brilliant. Um, and you've got like pots of pickled onions, pots of the slaw. So the, the well, basically all the food you make goes into different end products. Yeah. Do you have an idea of how much produce you save from going to waste like in a week or a month or whatever, sort of roughly? So I'd say we probably use, I don't know, 100 kilos a week of stuff. That's amazing, isn't it? So you're saving all this food from going to waste, you're feeding people and people are earning money like yeah. in all parts. Yeah. Of the... yeah, and you know, they're earning money and we're showing it can be done. Mm. Do you think people automatically collect food waste and food poverty? Everybody needs to take responsibility for food waste and, and you can't just solve the whole thing by saying, oh, well, we're passing on this waste to people who need it because they need all sorts of stuff. They don't need waste, they need, or surplus, because I don't see it as waste. It's not the answer, it's just something that's happened, I think. Yeah, and also I just think when you label something as waste and the only avenue you can see that going to is people who are living under the poverty line, it yeah. kind of makes, I don't know, an association that I don't, I'm not that comfortable with. Yeah, you know, if, if Tesco's wanted a wasted kitchen in every store, then, you know, bring it on. Yeah, and you know, if you go to um, any of these sort of independent international markets for one of them, better term a lot of them have got little cafes or people in the back making yeah. things using the produce and you're pretty sure they're using the produce that needs to be used not True. Uh, not using the stuff that's come in today mm. and so that is happening and that's you know historically that's what mm. definitely would have happened right but the whole thing's become divorced the supply chain has become divorced from the production and it's just ingredients it's not People aren't thinking back a stage. Katie Newton, founder of Wasted Kitchen, who, like Matt the dumpster diver, believes there is a systemic problem. Although they are both individuals doing their bit within the system, they're kind of picking up the slack for problems further up the chain. But what are those problems? Well, weirdly, we don't really know. One of the odd things about food waste is there is very little data in the public domain. Because it isn't mandatory for food businesses to report their waste, all we have is a voluntary, albeit long-running, scheme run by the NGO Waste and Resources Action Programme. They share their overall findings, but they don't produce a food waste league table or verify the data reported by the supermarkets. Producer Nina Pullman spoke to RAP to find out more. My name's Estelle Hirschenhorn. I'm RAP's Head of Food System Transformation. We're funded through a variety of sources. So we do get government funding. We're also funded by trusts and foundations around the world. And also businesses that are part of the Courtauld Commitment also make a financial contribution. Where we found like less information or just, you know, what we're hoping you can shed some light on is food waste in supermarkets. The court oil commitment is what we call a voluntary agreement. So it's a pact that different types of organisations, including the supermarkets, can sign up to. And all the major supermarkets in the UK are signed up to the court oil commitment. The supermarkets and any businesses that are signed up commit to measuring and reporting their food waste to wrap on an annual basis. And I think it can be quite surprising for people when they learn that actually in the UK, there's 10.7 million tonnes of food waste arising every year. And the vast majority of that, 60%, is in our homes. By comparison, the next kind of biggest areas where there's food waste, so 60% in household 
And then our estimates are that on farm, there's around 15% of the total food waste. In food manufacture, there's around 13% of the total food waste. In hospitality and food service, so that's things like restaurants, hotels, cafes, that's around 10% of the total. And in fact, only 2% of all the food waste in the UK is in supermarkets. So on the farm one in particular, my understanding is that there's very little data about food. I mean, how do you know how much wet food waste comes from farms? It's not perfect data. So there are some areas where it's much more challenging. So one of those is on farm food waste. Another is in some restaurants and bars. So how many farms are you monitoring to get that estimate? It's not from one source of information. So there is, there's some information from local authorities. There's some information from the Environment Agency. There's some information that we take from the National Food Survey. So there's lots of different evidence. On the, on the supermarket side then, how do you know that they're giving you all their data? A lot of the supermarkets also... Um, publish their own food waste data now. Food businesses now, I think, want to demonstrate to people, particularly their customers, but also shareholders, that they are taking action on food waste. Obviously, you encourage them to do it. It's a good thing for them to do. Some of them do it anyway publicly. Do you think it should be law that they have to report their food waste? We we can definitely see the benefits from mandatory food waste reporting. Could you tell me a little bit about what's been achieved on the reduction side? So for the retail sector to halve its food waste by 2030, retail food waste must fall by a further 31% in nine years between 2021 and 2030. But because retail food waste makes up only 2% of the food waste in the UK, what's really important in terms of the action that retailers can take is to help their supply chains reduce food waste, but most importantly, help all of us, their customers, to reduce food waste in our homes. Yeah, I mean, whilst researching this programme, we've heard from other people within the industry, like a level of scepticism around that figure itself. I think that people, you know, maybe don't trust it because of the fact it's voluntary. Is there a way of verifying it? The food waste estimates we have are from multiple sources. There are independent verifications actually Food businesses are very conscious that the information that they provide, particularly because so many of them are reporting publicly, has to be validated. And our measurement and reporting as RAP, we're an independent organisation, we're very evidence-based. We are very transparent about what the sources of the data are. We're also working against an international food loss and waste protocol. You know, supermarket food waste in 2% is small. They obviously are a bit of a linchpin in the middle of a whole food supply exactly. chain. So what are some of the things that they can and maybe are doing to help households reduce waste? The key action would be selling loose fruit and veg simply because it's by far the most wasted items in our homes. So we estimate that if all apples, bananas potatoes were sold loose, we could reduce household food waste by around 50,000 tonnes a year. We also track the increases in surplus food redistribution and the increases to charitable surplus food redistribution are absolutely huge. I mean, one thing we've heard on the redistribution side is somebody still paid to produce that food and then it just ends up going to be donated. At the very top of that hierarchy, the thing we're all trying to is, is true food waste prevention. The next best solution down is where that food is good to eat, that it's redistributed to people. Food surplus redistribution can't solve the food waste problem. There's 10.7 million tonnes of food waste in the UK every year. So that's why redistribution is only one part of the picture. We need businesses to be truly reducing their own operational food waste and critically helping us all reduce food waste in our homes. Estelle Hershenhorn, Head of Food System Transformation at RAP. We asked the government what their plans are on food waste Given that new Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, Steve Reid, recently said a zero waste economy is one of his top five priorities. We also wanted to know if this government would consider making it law rather than voluntary for food businesses, including supermarkets, to report their waste. This is something Michael Gove said the Tories would do. But the policy was scrapped by his successor, Therese Coffey, 
And it isn't clear what will happen next. When we asked this question, the government told us it is assessing further measures to tackle food waste. They also said they're reviewing all funding for food waste policies, seemingly all to play for. For a more forthcoming assessment of food waste action on a national scale, particularly within the food industry, I called journalist Ian Quinn, chief reporter at industry magazine The Grocer, for his take on progress. Since I've been reporting on this, which is more than 10 years now, it has been a very much a roller coaster. Although some supermarkets do give out d- details, and it's all different, there's different types of reporting, it's not really a like for like comparison. So it's very difficult for people to really look at, at the figures and, and judge them. In the backdrop, the government promising that we're going to bring in these mandatory reporting which has never happened. So unsurprisingly, without that sort of stick, the industry voluntary efforts have waned. Labour have now sort of inherited that situation. And to be honest, we're expecting them to go ahead with it, although there's been no big announcement yet. It ends up inevitably with certain players doing more than others. Tesco get a lot of the the plaudits on this. They're not the only ones doing it, but they've made pretty major efforts on food waste transparency. But that's not reflected across the whole of retail. And if you have a, a common set of rules that everyone has to apply to, that's what you really need. The other massive elephant in the room on, on food waste reporting is the, the waste on farms. Hundreds of thousands of tonnes of food is ploughed straight back into the field every year. Definitely a key factor is supermarkets wanting certain specification of products. Obviously, that ultimately, you could say that's down to the consumer who won't buy certain products if they if they don't look perfect that this has been a line for a lot for a long time that they yes they do report and they report through the court hold but of course that's very different to having a public very open transparent reporting process which we've been calling for for years and it's all very well rap knowing how much morrison's or ricardo or Sainsbury's are wasted, but it's not the same as it being out there for everyone to see. You know, you can understand the reluctance for any sort of league table naming shaming situation. That's ultimately the reason why they do it through rap via call told in a sort of aggregated way rather than individually. If these companies' shareholders, if they see that their supermarket is falling behind, you know, in a government credited system for food waste reporting, then they're more likely to demand action rather than if it's some voluntary scheme that perhaps is changing from year to year in the way it's presented. So what about that 2% figure, the proportion that RAP says supermarkets contribute to food waste? If reporting on waste is voluntary, how accurate is that likely to be? The actual figures for waste within retail is small compared to the uh, waste that's at home. But the the impact that uh, retailers can have by being more transparent outweighs that, if you know what I mean. When you think the huge impact that retail has on that farm gate situation that we spoke about, I mean, it's their buying decisions and in many cases their specifications for products that is leading to that waste. You would have thought that the sort of age of secrecy and things like that was over, but it's still it's surprising actually uh, still how, how much of the stuff is still sensitive and kept under wraps, literally. One of the things that was strange is that that when they had the consultation on mandatory food rates reporting, it wasn't as if supermarkets were against. The BRC was in favour. Food and Drink Federation also supported it. There was a bit of a sort of, well, where's the opposition coming from, you know? um, And from what I can understand, the most vocal uh, part of the industry was, was the hospitality sector. And it does make sense if you think about it, the amount of food that you send back, you know, or you see in restaurants every single day that goes back, it does make sense that they'd be the ones who have most to lose. That was Ian Quinn, chief reporter at The Grocer magazine. We followed up with the BRC, that's the British Retail Consortium, the body that represents supermarkets and other food businesses, to ask whether they are still in favour of mandatory food waste reporting and what action their members are taking in the meantime. They told us that. Retailers take food waste seriously and are at the forefront of calling for mandatory food waste reporting for all food businesses. They are also taking actions such as redistributing excess food to individuals and charities and changing labelling around best before dates to ensure edible food is not thrown out. Rapp's assessment that 60% of food waste occurs in the home suggests that the responsibility to cut waste largely lies with us. The problem with that 
is in reality what we buy, how much of it, and even how we store it is dictated by forces mostly out of our control. Supermarkets, our own time pressures, even fridge designers. We'll come back to that. But there's no doubt that reducing how much food you throw out is a good thing. Food waste, if it ends up in the bin and then in landfill, is a powerful greenhouse gas emitter, not to mention a waste of money at a time when food inflation and the cost of living are a concern. And luckily, should you wish to cut your waste, there is a growing network of social media personalities, cookbook writers, almost kitchen life coaches ready to help. One of the most popular is Ellie Pear, who is another of our brilliant finalists in this year's BBC Food and Farming Awards. She hosted Judge and fellow social media star Max LaManna for a live version of one of her most popular food waste hacks. In May last year, I started a series on Instagram called Rollover Leftovers, which started without me planning it at all. It just is naturally the way that I cook at home. Because I'm recipe testing constantly while I'm writing recipes and I live on my own, I'm forever ending up with like little bits and pieces that need to be used up. What are you going to be cooking for us? What are you rolling over? Well, I'm going to go away for a few days as soon as you've left so um we've got various things i've got some fermented tomatoes that i made i've got some leftover Mm. tofu so i thought we'd make some tofu bacon i've got some amazing bagels which i will share with you that are in the freezer and we're going to make some like bagels so that i can take it on the train with me we're not wasting time we're not wasting any food let's get cracking come on chef (laughs) show us what we got the bagels are here just rewinding the clocks a little bit. I know you're running around, chef. Let me know if you need hands. I'm here. You previously ran your own cafe. Yeah. What did you learn about food waste while doing that job? When you run a small business, every single penny counts. Right. And so you learn to not waste stuff because you know those pennies turn into pounds. And every single thing that you buy in, you want to make the most of it. Before you arrived, I realised that this um, lettuce had been touching the back of the fridge, which is really naughty of me because I should have been more careful with it. But we can bring it back to life. So, do you have your defibrillator? Exactly. Yeah. It's the, coming down. The, 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 <laughs> and ice water stat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The salad spinner like this is one of the best things that you can invest in because so many things with a high water content, like radishes, lettuce, all sorts of things. They're just thirsty. Because the refrigerator is a cold, dark space and it's sucking the life out of our ingredients and that's why some of it goes limp and wilting and or it's touching the back of the fridge where there's condensation. Yeah, exactly. How hungry are you? I'm hungry. Okay. I mean, we don't want anything to go to waste, Ellie. Do you want to help with something? I can I could definitely help okay. with something. Um, um, can, you, can you pat? I can definitely pat. Okay. Just spread that out. I feel like I'm a ready, steady cook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah, I yeah. love. We have Nina, who's uh, behind holding the microphone, just chasing us around the kitchen. Right, so um, soy sauce, maple syrup, Henderson's relish, so it stays vegan for you. Basically, this is my life's work. Changing people's ideas about food waste and leftovers is nothing makes me happier. I'm just frying the slices that Max kindly dried off. And when they're crispy on both sides, we just pour that glaze over it and that's it, it's done. Food waste is such a huge issue for climate and we could reduce the amount of food waste we have and it'll, it'll be better for the environment. Um, is that how you got into it? Why did you want to really hone in on reducing food waste in the first place? Like I said, it started off in, in a cafe and if I'm honest with myself, it's for financial reasons at the beginning. I think generally as a society over the last 15 years, our understanding of like the difference that we can make in the home to um, reducing food waste has grown so much and there's so many people out there telling people what they should be doing. I really see that my job is to be that kind of like in between. I don't want to preach to anybody. I don't want to talk down to anybody. I want to, if people have heard what they need to be doing, I want to be the one to show them how to actually action that. A a little shot glass of water with three sad looking spring onions, but again, like Ellie said, there's just I mean, this one's regrowing already. It's regrowing another shoot because it's been, the roots have been placed in water. And if you do have spring onions that have roots or any vegetable for that matter that have the roots, you can put it in water and it will kind of resuscitate it and bring it back to life. Max, your uh, channel is often about food waste, right? How did you get into it? Having worked in restaurants, you see the amount of food that's being wasted on a daily basis. I mean, in New York City, dumpsters, those large dumpsters that you see in movies and television shows uh, at at a restaurant level, 
every day that food is being wasted. And it made me scratch my head and think, why is this happening? And then obviously before I can start pointing the finger at the restaurant saying, you need to do better, I had to point that finger at myself because I was also part of that uh, problem as well at at the individual, at the home level. But do you have any thoughts on what needs to happen at a sort of system level? There's various points where food can get wasted, right? It can be wasted in the field. So this is like uh, things that have been rejected before they've even been sold. Um, so there's opportunities there on our side because we can support businesses that buy that one key veg but we can also um, tell the supermarkets that we don't care and we can act with our with our wallets right so um, buying the wonky veg collections and making the supermarkets realize there's a market for that. I think we're the last line of defense um, and so it's you know a privilege to have food on the table and and, and with the the cost of living crisis with uh, all the global issues around the world there are people who are starving on a daily basis I think let's respect where this food is coming from and let's make it our duty to waste less. Um, I want you to try this bacon and tell me what you Yes, need. yes, yes, yes. Look, the sad spring onions got a new life. <laughs> They're live on Radio 4. Oh, wow. I could taste the, the smokiness. You would have no idea that this was made from leftovers. We rolled it over <laughs> with Ellie Pear. Well done, Ellie. Do I have any Thanks. bacon sauce on no. my face? Okay, <laughs> good. Because that was delicious. Good. I'll have, a, I'll have another. <laughs> that was Max Lamanna visiting Ellie Pear, a finalist in the digital creator category in this year's BBC Food and Farming Awards. From Ellie's fridge to somewhere quite a lot closer to home. In fact, it is my own home where I had a slightly unusual visitor. Emma, yes, come nice in, come Thanks in. So hey, so how are you going? Nice to into your home and your fridge. Yes. Yeah, I'm Emma Atkins. I'm a PhD researcher um, in sustainable futures at the University of Bristol. It's a quite a familiar location for me. We are in my kitchen. It is not often we are recording for the food programme in my home. I think this has actually never happened. So here we are. And I'm with Emma, and we are standing in front of my fridge. I understand you're doing a quite interesting PhD. I'm looking at food waste in people's homes, and specifically to what extent the design of the fridge can influence waste. So whether that's through its physical design, like having deep shelves and deep drawers, or its place in our lives more generally. Okay. So I feel like we, we need to <laughs> do the grand reveal and open my fridge. We, right, so what, sh what should we do? What do I do? <laughs> so the first thing I ask participants is just if they can show me around their fridge. Okay. So we open it up. Yes, like let's that. open it, yes. And it's sort of like a tour. So if you want to sort of take me around. <laughs> tour of my fridge. And, yeah. Okay. Ready. Well, what you, <laughs> what you probably notice is I actually, um, I kind of cut compart mentalize and label areas so what i've actually got is on each shelf i've got a sort of separate plastic tray or box of some sort with a label such as yogurt and dairy or cheese or salad ingredients mm. which i found very easy because if i want to get this pot of yogurt right at the back i can just pull this out and get to it easily so what are your thoughts emma well, obviously, it's incredibly organised fridge. Um, as a fridge nerd, I'm extremely impressed by this. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Throwing food away doesn't sit well with us, and we'll do whatever we can to not do it. So it's not often we, we, we discard food. However, Nina told me about your post-it thing, where you put a post-it in your fridge for where something has been dis discarded or gone off. And there is a post-it in the very bottom drawer because what happened was I zested a clementine. I think I put the clementine back in and forgot it had been zested and because it didn't really have the skin anymore, it just turned to mush. So we chucked it, I'm ashamed no, to fair say. Enough. So really interestingly, I have noticed that things tend to go more to waste the further down mm. you go. And the vegetable drawer or the fruit drawers tend to be the culprits when it comes to food waste. Which is exactly the case here. Yes, which is really interesting. Oh, wow. um, a couple of my participants don't use their vegetable drawers at all anymore because they just know that uh, food will go to waste there. And so they just stay empty and their fruit and veg go somewhere more visible. Do you find any link between the size of the fridge and how much waste a person produces? Yes, I think there's definitely something there. Um, so firstly, if you have a bigger fridge, it allows you to buy more food 
and in bulk and potentially less often. And there was um, a couple of Norwegian researchers that found that um, people who waste the least food tend to be the ones that shop more regularly. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of the refrigerator? Like when, because we didn't always have them. No. The fridge as we know it was invented in 1927 by General Electric in the USA. Um, but before that, people had ice boxes. So it was literally a, a wooden cabinet where you'd put a massive block of ice. And actually, the fridge has always been a box. It's never not been a box. And I think the visibility issues are to do with that box shape. Um, and I actually brought with me a few designs from the 1950s that sort of allude to this visibility problem. Do you want to see them? Yes. Oh, yes. And my main question is, was food waste a factor in its design evolution? And I found this fridge. It's a fridge with rotating shelves. Oh, my gosh. And as you can see, you can sort of swing the shelves around and it makes everything more visible. And actually, in another advert of the same fridge, there's a line in it that says, no more hard to reach corners where leftovers are forgotten. So they knew back then that visibility was a problem in the fridge and this design tried to mitigate against it. And my initial reaction is this is genius. But that this doesn't exist today, does it? No. So I'm trying to find out why this design didn't make it to the modern day. And as far as I can tell, it only lasted four years in the US. When did supermarkets start? They started the about the same time as fridges. And it's really interesting because they sort of reinforced each other. They had this symbiotic relationship where supermarkets allowed you to buy more stuff at once and fridges allowed you to store more stuff at once. So they sort of both worked in tandem. It's kind of my perspective that it shouldn't always be on consumers to fix sustainability problems. It's not our fault the fridge is a box mm. and it's not our fault that it was designed this way. And, you know, obviously we can all play our part, but if it was really easy to reduce food waste, then we would do it. Do you discard much food? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can't like, I'm not here to moralise food waste. Everybody wastes food. I think it's a more systemic problem than an individual problem. And I think things like selling things in smaller portions, being clearer on expiry dates and redesigning the fridge, they could all help enormously. So what are the solutions? Well, for some like Emma, it's a fridge redesign. For Katie at Wasted Kitchen, it's a bolt on local business, buying surplus food from supermarkets and sending it back out for sale. Others see enforced food waste reporting as the only way to make genuine improvements. One thing that's really come across for me is the value of food as well as the value of people's labour. Clearly, there are also bigger things at stake. Donating surplus food to charities and food banks is not a long-term solution to either food waste or food poverty. Here's Matt Homewood, our pro-dumpster diver and food waste campaigner, with some final thoughts. Certainly, I mean, the consumer's not innocent, but they've got enough problems on their hands. When it comes to commercial food waste, for me, the power very much lies in the hands of the supermarkets. But yeah, and then, of course, you know, the government has a lot of power implementing the right policies. You know, probably like Denmark, too much focus on food banks and not enough concrete policy that addresses the root causes. The full list of our BBC Food and Farming Awards 2024 finalists is now available online. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash food awards. The Food Programme was presented by me, Leila Kazim, and produced by Nina Pullman for BBC Audio in Bristol. This podcast is brought to you by eHarmony, the dating app to find someone you can be yourself with. Why doesn't eHarmony allow copy and paste in first messages? Because you are unique and your conversations should reflect that. eHarmony wants you to find someone who will get you. How are you going to know who gets you if people send you the same generic conversation starters they message everyone else? Conversations that actually help you get to know each other. Imagine that. Get who gets you on eHarmony. Sign up today. If there's one thing that my family and friends know me for, it's being an amazing gift giver. I owe it all to Celebrations Passport from 1-800-Flowers.com, my one-stop shopping site that has amazing gifts for every occasion. With Celebrations Passport, I get free shipping on thousands of amazing gifts. And the more gifts I give, the more perks and rewards I earn. To learn more and take your gift giving to the next level, 
Visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST.